I'm going to be teaching you Einstein's theory of relativity, but don't worry, I know that sounds super intimidating, it's not as hard as you probably think it is. Regular relativity, they call it classic relativity, is something that you guys, I'm sure, all intuitively understand already, even if you're not aware of it. So, I'm so confident in that that I bet you that I can get you guys to describe for me what classic relativity is just by asking you guys some guiding questions. So, here's the guiding questions. How fast do you think you are moving right now? What is your current velocity? Anyway. Relative to the sun or relative to what we're to right now? Yeah. That is the perfect answer. That is like that is classic relativity. That you can't there is no such thing as absolute velocity. Someone might say my current velocity is zero miles per hour because I'm not moving but you're not moving relative to this classroom, or relative to the surface of the Earth. Someone might say, well, the Earth is spinning, so if you consider the center of the Earth to be at rest, like how fast someone on the equator is moving because of the spinning of the Earth is roughly a thousand miles an hour. So someone could say, I'm moving about a thousand miles an hour due to the spin of the Earth, or relative to the center of the Earth. That is classic relativity. You have to give your velocity relative to something, hence relativity. There is no such thing as absolute velocity. All velocity is relative. To kind of give this a little more concreteness um, with some numbers, let's imagine there's a semi-truck driving along a road. And it's got this big, long trailer. Let's say on this trailer there's a pitcher, and he pitches a baseball and that baseball is moving at 10 meters per second relative to the pitcher. But let's also say that the truck is moving at 5 meters per second. So how fast is the baseball truck? 15, 15 meters per second relative, relative, to someone standing the road. relative to the ground. So basically, if there was someone with a radar gun standing on the ground, his radar gun would read the speed of that baseball at the 10 miles an hour that it has relative to the pitcher, plus the 5 miles an hour that the pitcher had because of the truck. But what if there was someone standing on this side of the truck with a radar gun? What was his gun say? I would say 10 miles or 10 meters per second because that's 10 meters per second relative to the bed of the truck, right? So that is classic relativity. Special relativity is special. Um, pretty much all of this came about when a guy named Maxwell came up with his equations to describe electromagnetism. Have you guys heard of Maxwell's equations by any chance? Well, Maxwell was the scientist who came up with these four equations that describe all of electromagnetism. Pretty much any event that anyone had ever observed dealing with electricity or with magnetism or with electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation, you guys have probably seen the electromagnetic spectrum, right? It goes from radio waves to microwaves to visible light, all the way up to gamma rays and everything. All of that is electromagnetic radiation, which is effectively light. Light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. It's just each of those different types has different wavelengths, but they all travel at the speed of light. So I'm just going to refer to electromagnetic radiation as light from now on, um, just to keep things a little bit simpler. Anyway, he came up with these four equations that anything anyone had ever observed about electricity or magnetism or light, this, these four equations describe it perfectly. And so everyone was like, yes, we have solved electromagnetism. Like, we can predict what's going to happen in any circumstance dealing with electricity or magnetism or light. This is awesome. But there was an unexpected consequence from his theories. From his equations, you can derive that light has a speed. Anybody happen to know what the speed of light is? It is very fast. It's generally relative to. I'm getting to you. It's 3.0 times 10 to the eighth, or 300,000 meters per second. But the thing is, from classic relativity, we know that there's no such thing as absolute velocity, right? Like, you always need to give your velocity relative to something. And these equations weren't giving 
velocity relative to anything. These equations are implying that the speed of light is always this, relative to anything and everything. This is a problem. Like, what if, rather than a pitcher, what if this truck was driving along and drove past a lamp? So this light bulb is going to be putting out light, and the light is going to be traveling at the speed of light. But just to simplify things here for a moment, rather than saying the speed of light is this, again, we're simplifying things just for a minute, let's pretend that the speed of light were that same 10 meters per second. Well, this guy standing on the ground would just measure that at 10 meters per second. No problem, right? But this guy on the truck is moving at 5 meters per second. So you'd think that he would measure this moving at 10 meters per second relative to the ground where it's being emitted from minus his 5 meters per second going away from it. You'd think that his gun would register at, at 5 meters per second, right? So this is a paradox. Basically, Maxwell's equations don't agree with our theory of motion. Like, these two theories are in conflict. Everyone was thinking one of these two theories has to be wrong because they don't agree with each other. And so this went on for, I believe, years. Like, for years, this was the problem in all of science, was trying to get, trying to figure out what was wrong with one of these two theories, and no one could figure it out until Einstein came along and just turned the world on its head. He took an intellectual leap that is just indescribable, indescribably huge. Pretty much what he said is rather than saying that this is a paradox and that one of these two theories is wrong, he said, what if they're both right? What if we're making an assumption that everybody naturally makes always, but that assumption is wrong? The assumption that everyone always naturally makes has to do with time and with space. You measure velocity in some distance over some distance traveled over some passage of time, right? So basically, rather than a radar gun, let's pretend these guys don't have radar guns. They have stopwatches and they have meter sticks. The assumption that we're making is that the stopwatches click off time at the same rate and that the meter sticks are the same length. He's saying maybe they're not. He's saying maybe the person that's moving has a clock that's moving slower, and maybe he has a meter stick that's shorter. That can account for the difference and the, allow this guy to still measure the thing, the photon moving at 10 meters per second. Like, it really is hard to describe how big a leap this is. Like, I'm, I've been trying to come up with an analogy, and the best thing I can come up with is pretty much science, the goal of science is to explain, like, everything, right? And so rather than just trying to explain anything that we might observe, I imagine this as they're building this ceiling. And every time they figure something out, it's like laying a new brick in the ceiling. And Maxwell came along, and he laid this huge swath of bricks into the ceiling that described all of electromagnetism. And everyone was like, yes, we just got this huge portion of the ceiling filled in finally. This is awesome. But then they realized that, wait, there's a little crack. Like, this theory doesn't meet up with this theory quite perfectly. There's a little crack between them. What's wrong here? And they work on it for years. And the solutions that they're trying to come up with are effectively like they're trying to decide what color paint to paint over the crack. That's what they're trying to do in this analogy. And Einstein, in this analogy, comes along with like a freaking bulldozer full of dynamite. And what he does is he blows up one of the support beams holding the ceiling up. And this, like half the ceiling just comes crumbling to the ground. And all the other scientists are looking around at him like, kid, because he was only 26 years old when he did this. They're like, kid, what the hell did you just do? They're painting. He's blowing crap up. It really is hard to describe how big a leap this is. But basically, if he just came along and said that, well, what I just did was pretty much get rid of this underlying theory that you were trying to use to support your science that was incorrect. If he had just said that, if he had said pretty much time is relative, time is not always ticking at the same rate for everybody, 
Like, you need to throw that assumption off out of the window. You need to blow it up. If you just left it at that and everyone would have been like, kick him out of the building, get rid of this guy. But he didn't just come along with that assumption. He came along with his entire theory of special relativity, this huge paper that he wrote. This is a scientific theory, not theory as in like the connotation that we use the word theory with today, like I think this might be true. A scientific theory is like the theory of gravity or the theory of evolution. It is something that can explain a wide variety of observations across multiple different disciplines. He came through with this theory and he was effectively, in our analogy, what he did is he's like, don't worry about this, I got this. And then he replaced that little support beam that he blew up by building this amazing hallway that is so much stronger and so much more beautiful than the little support beam that was there before that when he put all the pieces of science back together in the ceiling, they all fit perfectly. It is truly, it's amazing what he did. But basically that is the theory of relativity. What the theory of relativity says is the faster you move, the slower time moves for you. And the faster you move, the more length contracts in the direction of motion. That is all you need to map, wrap your mind around. I realize that's a leap, but that's all it says. It says the faster you move, the slower time moves. What's a little more difficult is trying to get you guys to understand why. Because time moves slower when you move faster, you would expect a clock to tick slower when you're moving faster, right? Well, what is a clock? A clock is pretty much anything that has some sort of regular interval of events happening. Like old-fashioned clocks have pendulums that are swinging once per second, right? You can use any regular passage of events like that to keep time as a clock. So rather than a swinging of a pendulum, let's invent a theoretical clock. What if we had a mirror up here and a mirror down here, and there was a photon of light that started right here, and then it came down to this mirror, bounced off, and came back up here? Well, light travels at a constant velocity, right? So the amount of time that it takes for it to get from here down to here and back up is always going to be a regular interval, right? So we could theoretically use this as a clock. But what would happen if you put this clock in motion? So let's imagine I have one of these clocks sitting right here. The photon of light is just bouncing straight up and down vertically. Now imagine I have a second one of these clocks. I'm going to leave that clock there. I have a second clock now, and I am going to start moving with it. I, from my frame of reference, I still see this thing bouncing straight up and down, but from a rest point of reference, what do you guys see? What does the path of that photon look like for you? It looks like it's <coughs> Like for me, it's straight up and down, but for you guys, do you see how straight up and down for me is diagonal for you guys? So, effectively, what's happening here is rather than straight up and down like that, a moment later, the clock will have moved to the side a little bit, so it's now sitting right here by the time the photon has gotten to the bottom, which means its path will travel in a diagonal. But light always travels at the same speed, right? So, having to travel this distance versus having to travel this distance, if it's traveling at the same speed, it's going to take it longer to travel that distance, right? So this tick and subsequent talk of the clock is going to take longer if the clock is in motion than it would if it just had to tick talk vertically, right? And this is not just a quirk of the clock. It's not just because we're using this photon of light as our thing to keep track of time. This will happen for any type of clock. They've experimented with this, and they had what they call an atomic clock. And pretty much the mechanism that it uses to keep track of time is something to do with like the frequency of a microwave that is given off by an atom of cesium or something. Anyway. This is so accurate that these clocks will lose only, or like less than two nanoseconds per day. A nanosecond is a billionth of a second. So these things will stay accurate within two billionths of a second over an entire day. 
they had actually four of these clocks, but for sake of argument, let's just simplify things. Imagine they had two of these clocks. They kept one on the ground, and this literally happened. They put another on a plane, and they flew it around the world twice. So this took just over a day, probably. So you'd expect that if relativity weren't a thing, these things would still be accurate to each other within two or three nanoseconds, right? They were off by 273 nanoseconds. Because the clock in motion experienced time dilation, because time slowed, time itself slowed down for that clock. It's not just a quirk of using a photon as a clock. Any clock will physically tick slower because time physically passes slower for anything in motion. This has all kinds of crazy consequences. Let's say you have a set of identical twins, the exact same age. What if one of those twins got on a theoretical rocket ship that could travel way faster than any rocket ship actually can? That thought experiment has basically come true. Check this out.